Welcome to the Dakota Live podcast. I'm your host, Robert Morier. The goal of this podcast is to help you better know the people behind investment decisions. We introduce you to chief investment officers, manager research professionals, sales leaders, and other important players in the industry who will help you sell in between the lines and better understand the investment sales ecosystem. If you're not familiar with Dakota and their Dakota Live content, please check out their website at dakota.com and learn more about their services. Uh, Before we get started, I need to read a brief disclosure. This content is provided for informational purposes and should not be relied upon as recommendations or advice about investing in securities. All investments involve risk and may lose money. Dakota does not guarantee the accuracy of any of the information provided by the speaker who is not affiliated with Dakota. Not a solicitation, testimonial, or an endorsement by Dakota or its affiliates. Nothing herein is intended to indicate approval, support, or a recommendation of the investment advisor or its supervised persons by Dakota. Today's episode is brought to you by Dakota Marketplace. Are you tired of constantly jumping between multiple databases and channels to find the right investment opportunities? Introducing Dakota Marketplace, the comprehensive institutional and intermediary database built by fundraisers for fundraisers. With Dakota Marketplace, you'll have access to all channels and asset classes in one place, saving you time and streamlining your fundraising process. Say goodbye to the frustration of searching through multiple databases and say hello to a seamless and efficient fundraising experience. Sign up now and see the difference Dakota Marketplace can make for you. Visit dakotamarketplace.com today. I am very happy to introduce our audience to our guest today, Sinsin Liu from Anco. Welcome to Philadelphia. Thank you, Robert. Thank you for being here. And as always, Dandy Domenico from Dakota, thank you for being here. Always a pleasure. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. It's always nice to have you on the desk. And we're very happy to have Sinsin here today. Uh, Coming up from Florida to visit us here in Philadelphia at the Dakota Studios. We have a lot of questions to ask you over the next 45 minutes or so. Before we do, I'm going to read your biography for the audience. So really quickly, Anco Consulting is an independent SEC registered institutional investment consulting firm headquartered in Winter Park, Florida. In January 2015, the firm's founding partner, Joe Bogdan, sold his majority units to the business. In doing so, that event became the catalyst that became the process of recycling equity back into the company, creating a 100% employee-managed organization. As of December 2022, they are responsible for nearly $91 billion in assets under advisement, advising hundreds of institutional clients across the United States, Bermuda, and Canada. Since then, joined Anco Consulting in early 2022 and focuses on private equity and private debt investment research, servicing institutional clients. Previously, she held a variety of roles with Wells Fargo for nearly 12 years as an analyst, strategist, and consultant, with responsibilities ranging from manager research, focusing on private real assets, real estate infrastructure and natural resources, and REITs, to leading the sourcing and due diligence for private equity, private debt, and private real asset funds, Simpson has an extensive background in manager research and selection. Prior to financial services, Sinsen worked for seven years in web development and design. As Sinsen received her undergraduate degree from Beijing University of Aeronautics and Astronautics, now Beihang University, and a master's in technology and management from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Sinsen is a CFA and current board member of the CFA Society of Orlando, where she also volunteers her time. She is also a certified financial risk manager. Finally, Sinsen calls the greater Orlando area home. Sinsen, welcome again. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here in the studio. It's really wonderful to have you. Well, we always like to start with the beginning of our guest's career. You graduated from now Beihang University, uh, widely considered one of the top engineering schools in China with an emphasis uh, on engineering. So how did you come to choose the school originally? That was a long time ago, Uh, (laughs) college years. So similar to all high schoolers, didn't have any idea what I wanted to study. uh, Thinking about, mainly thinking about the program that I'm pursuing. Uh, In China, you choose your major before you actually get into college. So there was this thing called management information systems that kind of crossed discipline between management and information technology. And that really drew me into that area and among all the top schools schools that offer those programs um, behind, as you mentioned, is one of the top schools and applied. And I didn't stretch myself too far because I want to be getting a sure win. <laughs> so you may have heard of uh, the other top schools in China. And I, I decided Beihang or um, BOA was a great place for me to be. So I went there also as um, I guess it's worth mentioning back then was when um, 
the Top Gun movie was released in China, <laughs> and aeronautics, <laughs> astronaut, it uh, sounds really cool. So that probably also played the factor. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, how about the journey from Beijing to Greensboro? That's a, a long way to go. You continue. You're continuing your education, uh, but you did come to the United States. So what what was that? What was that journey like for you? Yeah. So that was、uh, quite different. So when I was going to college, I didn't want to. I grew up in Beijing. I didn't want to go anywhere outside of Beijing for university. And then、uh, after graduating college, there are a lot of students、um, considering. I know that I want to do, pursue a graduate degree, and the th- question is, where do I go? And a lot of Students are coming to the United States, pursuing advanced degrees, and、um, so I kind of found that interesting. Especially、uh, back then, when I was little, my father studied in London, so I was like, "Oh, that's really cool to go overseas and see the world."、Uh, I applied to school and admitted by UNCG, who、uh, also offered the again the major management information systems that I'm interested in. I got full scholarship from them.、Um, Thank, very thankful for their offering.、Uh, so there I go, from a mega city Beijing <laughs> to a little little town called Greensboro. Yeah, beautiful town though. And you started your career with UNC Greensboro, is that yes, correct?、I、in、did. technology. Yes, I did. And then seven years web development technology. You took that into Wells Fargo. What did you take from those first seven years when you entered the the, the financial services field? When I came to the states was two thousand one when technology was having the. Dot com bubble right after、um, a lot of students are interested in that. So I started my career in information technology. I was doing web design, web、uh, development, and that gave me an entry ticket into Wells Fargo as database analyst. So I really started at, at Wells Fargo as a technology person. Just by pure luck, I joined a group、uh, in wealth investment management called、uh, Alternative Investment Group. I was recruited and helping them to build a,、uh, build a database to keep track of their hedge fund managers. So that's my transition point. And during that work with、uh, hedge fund、um, manager research people,、uh, alternative investment research people. I found myself really interested in the investment side of things. When I was facing that crossroad between should I want to be a technology person continuously, or should I want to be something that's completely different from my prior training, I decided to take a take a big leap of faith and decided to pursue a little bit of education,、um, thinking this is a rare opportunity for me to get exposure to investment. Research. Well, you were there for twelve years. So, what was that investment manager research process like at Wells Fargo?、Uh, I'm sure it evolved over those years, as your career did as well.、Uh, but it would, I think, it would be helpful for our audience just to have a sense of, you know, what did Wells Fargo look like then, and、um, you know, how did it evolve as it relates to the the research process. Yeah, so it has been a <laughs> a long time, as you mentioned. Mainly, Wells Fargo, as you as you know, it's a one of the Large warehouses, so the process is very much、um, centralized in this organization. Eventually, by the time I left,、uh, it's called Wells Fargo Investment Institute, which is really the thinking tank, the the brain of the entire.、Um, Wealth management advisory、uh, business. So, being a large warehouse, there is a certain level of requirement when it comes to looking for managers, whether they have、um, a certain size, which can support the broader、um, investor base of a larger warehouse. And thinking about, I think it was like. Two trillion dollars asset under advisement, and then you have fourteen thousand well,、uh, advisors that are implementing these kind of advices. So,、um, back at the larger shop.、Um, The managers that we're looking at tend to be one of those larger names, and then、uh, there is a certain level of minimum fund size to accommodate the investors. Well, 
then after 12 years, congratulations. You joined ANCO last year uh, in a new role. We look forward to hearing more about that. But for the benefit of our audience, would you mind sharing an overview of ANCO's business, uh, specifically uh, you know, how, how ANCO works with their client partners? Sure. So ANCO, as you mentioned at the beginning, is an independent investment consulting firm. Most of our clients are institutional investors with um, public pension uh, taking a large percent, percentage of our uh, asset under advisement. We're a proud provider of the investment uh, advice for state and city municipal teachers, firefighters, police officers. I think that's really one of the reasons I, I, that drew me into an uh, Yanko um, providing this kind of service. We, were, uh, we are headquartered in a suburb, suburb of Orlando, Florida. I uh, have about... Um, close to 100 people. Um, the firm was founded 20 years ago. So if in case anybody is curious about the name of uh, ANCO, uh, what, to be honest, when I first got exposure to ANCO, I was, uh, was kind of curious, why ANCO, right? So that's really the reminder for us on a daily basis that um, the principle of our company is we always put our clients first. And with that principle, we named our company uh, Clients and Company. That means without clients, we are incomplete. We always have the clients in front of our names. That's wonderful. I like that. That's great. Well, congratulations to Anco for being awarded the 2022 Greenwich Quality Leader Award. I started my career at Greenwich Associates, so I know that's not a small feat. Um, so talk about many moons ago. Back then, we had an e-commerce department. There was no e-commerce after 2002 as a result of that same bubble we were talking about. But can you describe the core philosophy that guides Anco's investment manager research process? So how does the team think about asset manager research kind of starting from the top down? So it always starts with uh, our consultants building up uh, the investment policy statements with their, client, with their clients on an individual basis. From there, we run the asset allocation study. And then based on uh, using the efficient frontier and uh, capital market assumption, from there, only from there, uh, the consultants are starting to look at the portfolio and think uh, plugging those slots with the manager requirement, whether it be uh, large cap value, small cap uh, growth, or uh, private market exposure. So it goes from uh, top down in that sense. So it sounds like it's a very collaborative process mm -hmm. where you're working with the consultants and then you're trying to optimize the, the portfolios in terms of diversification and asset allocation. Mm -hmm. uh, is there anything else that you would want to share in terms of how the team interacts in those conversations and how direct do you even get with, their, with the, your, your clients? Yeah, so um, I'm part of the research team, so most of the times we are sitting behind the scenes, but we do work very closely with consultants, and sometimes we get drafted into the client meetings to make a uh, manager presentation, giving them our um, our research view on what we think about managers. Typically, we would present a few options for the clients, and then... Um, we would lay out the pros and cons. Eventually, it's the client's decision, um, but we would um, provide our opinions on, on managers that we are putting in front of the clients. So, so what does the team look like today in terms of coverage and responsibilities across asset classes? Sure. So currently, the research team uh, is led by executive director uh, Evan Scosso. We have there are a dozen of us um, at the different level of their career stages. <laughs> we have a very talented team where we implement a specialized model, which means uh, each analyst has their main coverage area. And in uh, public equity, private equity, fixed income, real assets. And some of us are covering more than one asset classes. And we have a lead and um, backup uh, covering analyst model. Great. Is everybody based in uh, outside of Orlando? Yes. So the entire research team is based in the Orlando headquarter office Perfect. while our consultants are out there with their clients. Perfect. 
Um, I'm going to shift this in thinking about risk management now and just the various strategies that maybe you all are incorporating into your investment research process. We define risk as the probability of permanent loss of capital. So we take it very care, uh, very seriously because it's impacting our clients, which like the retirement retirees pension plans. And I would say I would say um, the best way for to reflect our thinking of risk management is through our manager due diligence process. We have a very, very rigorous due diligence process. It starts with the analyst who leads uh, the research on the particular manager, doing their due diligence work, forming their thesis, and get, gaining conviction, writing a full-length memo, which then get peer reviewed by one of he, him or her colleagues who's also an expert in this area. I'm going back to our uh, talking, us talking about um, the lead and backup analyst model. And from there, the thesis is being discussed in the um, smaller group of the, uh, of the peers, typically around three, four people. At this point, the lead analyst who's doing the manager due diligence is getting challenged and questioned by all of his or her peers and um, figuring out what are you missing? Why do you really feel they're going to be able to generate the kind of return and value creation that they claimed? Only after that, the finalized memo get assembled together and um, being presented to our firm's investment policy committee. The investment policy company the investment policy committee is made up our CEO, so coming from the top, chief operating officer and chief compliance officer, executive director of consulting, executive director of research. Mm -hmm. And they have the final vote on whether this is a risk that we feel comfortable um, for our clients to take. So it sounds like risk management is incorporated into every step of the process. Absolutely. So when you're thinking about now that underwriting process for the ultimate selection of an investment manager, uh, two questions. Mm -hmm. One, what are the steps that you're taking? Are you going on site? Are you doing conference calls? Are you interacting with the portfolio managers? Mm -hmm. And then second question attached to that is, well, what's the outcome? Is it a select list, a recommended list? Like how does that work at ANCO in terms of having conviction in those managers? Yeah, so two big questions. <laughs> um, so going into a little bit more details about our due diligence process, speaking from my firsthand experience, ANCO has an open door policy. So that, what does that mean? That means we are willing and happy to talk to all of the managers that come knocking at our doors. Mm -hmm. And we pride ourselves for always being responsive and giving them feedback. So that gave us uh, a very broad um, funnel at the, at the top. And from there, to make things a little bit more efficient, there are thousands, if not more, uh, hundreds of thousands of managers out there. We have a preferred institutional quality standard questionnaire. So we send to the managers and um, um, some of the typical preferences include SEC registration, um, insurance, and um, uh, whether the firm is of a certain size that can sustain its own uh, growth for the long-term investment that our invest uh, our investors are uh, pursuing. So um, that's the very first screening step. Um, from there, if everything looks right, fits our uh, institutional client's quality, then uh, we would schedule an introduction meeting with the manager. From there, we, did, we talk about the general uh, strategy they're pursuing, the, the, team, the, the team and the firm history, and um, getting a basic understanding of the strategy from that conversation. If the fund and strategy sounds interesting, we would uh, request data room access, getting more offering material, getting deep into the analysis as an analyst, from an analyst perspective. And from there, after we do our due diligence of doing the desk review, what we call the desk review. And after that, we would schedule a due diligence session. 
in most cases, we would like to go on site and visit the manager because there is a tremendous value to be gained from talking to someone face to face. I guess that's why. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you do observe the dynamic of the team. You get to meet more people in the investment manager's team and see how they interact. After the on site, the formalized recommendation memo is being crafted and then it goes on to what, what I have described in the multiple four stages of approval process and being challenged and, and vetted through the, uh, through the, through the team. I just a quick question as it relates to private markets and your area of focus. So once you've done that level of screening, you're on site, you're meeting the manager research team. Do you take it a step further and do you go visit any of the portfolio companies that these managers are investing in? Like how granular does the team get? So the granular analysis goes into um, our track record analysis. We do like look at each deal's uh, cash flow. And we do talk about case study. We do a, a go over case studies when we are doing the on-site ma- meeting with the managers. For um, unfortunately, I wish we could go a little deeper on that, but um, we would uh, select the representative um, companies that we do. Uh, we do some detailed analysis on, but uh, we do not really meet um, the individual companies. I guess on that note, um, it's our common practice to get reference checks from our peer investors. Um, So LP checks is a big deal, especially if it's a manager that we haven't had much interaction with, especially for private market. This is my personal view here because the investment period is so long and it's such a deliberate process and you commit your money and probably not going to see the full uh, return of capital for at least 10 years, right? So it takes a long time for me to get comfortable with a certain manager. Sometimes if there's a quicker turnaround, getting uh, the investors who invest in the prior funds, um, seeing how their experience is like, um, what uh, what their think what their thinkings are regarding the new fund will be very very helpful for my due dil- for my due diligence process. So it sounds like quite a rigorous process when you initiate that conversation with Anco. Uh, be supportive of a long term uh, due diligence cycle. Yes, I would say, unfortunately, for the IRBD folks, you kind of have to be a little patient. For sure. And I'm sure the ongoing due diligence is just as rigorous. Maybe talk to us just about how you measure and track the success of those investment managers Mm -hmm. with whom you you ultimately uh, partner and allocate client capital to. Yeah, so we do have a monitoring process in place, uh, depending on whether it's public market or private market we're talking about. For the public market, we have a quarterly uh, exception process. Basically, if there is anything that we notice about the managers, uh, whether it's uh, team changes, uh, style drifts, or uh, ownership changes or some certain manager if you're uh, consistently having performance challenges that will get reflected in these quarterly exception report the covering analyst would address these kind of concerns in the written format and present to our investment policy committee this is being done on a quarterly basis private market is a little different um, because of the lag in reporting because of the length of the the fund life. For private markets, uh, we generally talk to our managers uh, on a six-month basis for all the funds that are are in market or the funds um, that, that we have recommended and the funds that have uh, that are in the investing and harvesting uh, stages. So it's quite a lot to cover when you're talking about the managers that we're ta- covering. Um, as mentioned, we engage in regular dialogues with them and checking to see how the fund is performing. It's my opinion that monitoring how the fund is progressing is a very important due diligence step for the consideration of the next vintage. And for our clients who have a little bit more robust, um, more built out the private equity portfolio, we would do an annual process of uh, evaluating 
how their portfolio is doing, not just from the performance basis, but also looking at their geographic exposure, sector exposure, and vintage year diversification. And then we kind of grade their managers on an annual basis, how they're performing to each of their corresponding peers. From there, we make our recommendation, do you need to add something? Do you need to slow down a little bit? And we have a whole different uh, commitment pacing exercise that we do. What does the mix of assets typically look like within the private markets portfolio? Um, are, are you looking at generalist versus specialist? And then as you just think about kind of each sleeve within private markets, you know, how are you spending your time? We do private equity, private debt, and private real assets. So private equity, takes about half of what we do. Um, just using last year as an example, our clients committed about $600 million into private equity funds. And for private credit, sorry, uh, and then that is followed by uh, private real assets, uh, that's including real estate infrastructure, about $300 million. And following that, that's the emerging growing area of private credit, uh, um, that uh, our clients uh, invested over 200 million in that space. And regarding to the manager specifically, we, we do both fund the fund, secondary fund and co-investment funds, multi-manager co-investment funds that is. But also we do a lot of direct investments, uh, direct uh, private equity funds as well. Zeroing in a little further. So for direct buyout and venture capital, we do tend to look for um, differentiated managers because we're looking for the alpha, looking for a differentiated approach where they can generate a little above market return. So just generally speaking, managers that fall into the mega buyout ca uh, categorization would be um, a little challenging to fit this kind of mandate. So we look for specialists, we look for managers that are very differentiated. That makes a lot of sense. So what does the typical partner profile look like in that regard? So are, are you looking at smaller teams, larger teams? Are there any you know, biases? I hate to use the word biases, but I think we all have them, particularly when we're either selecting a place to work or selecting a manager to invest in. So as ANCO looks at the private market manager universe, are there any characteristics that maybe span a little bit, little bit wider than others? Um, I would say... Yes and no. So Enco is a smaller company, right? So we are looking for our edge and we we're looking for managers. Uh, piggybacking on the previous question, we're looking for managers that has a proven consistent edge. It's a tricky balance. Being the advisor of pension plans, for example, investors who prefer a little bit more conservative risk return profile, we would typically not going for emerging managers. Um, what, do, uh, what I meant by that is fund one and two are generally a little harder for us to get across the hurdle of feeling comfortable in recommending those into our investors' portfolios. Enco being very client focused, we do recommend, we do cater to our clients' unique um, requirements. There are certain circumstances when we are advising clients who have their very unique requirement, their unique preferences. We would work directly with our clients and uh, conduct due diligence on the managers that fits their specific criteria. Just using an example in 2022 last year, Across the entire research team, we worked on approximately 100 funds that are specifically for individual client portfolio. Mm -hmm. So that's something that we pride ourselves on, but um, it definitely takes a lot of work at the same time. Regarding the manager's profile, we typically have a geographic preference of uh, North America or developed Europe. Emerging market is a little um, farther out of the risk return profile for us to consider. 
again, managers would need to have a certain size. The managers that we look at would typically have um, 200, uh, 250 million dollars in asset under management, or um, they have some other way to prove that they can sustain their uh, business operation. Well, you mentioned venture capital. There's a little bit of sunshine back on the sector. There were a couple well-received IPOs within the last few weeks, but just curious for our audience perspective, how are you talking about venture capital today with your clients as it relates to the current environment? Wow, that's a million dollar question, where if not a billion dollar question, um, as you put it, there has been a little bit of sunshine in this space lately. But looking in in the broader venture capital space, um, it seems to be continuously on the markdown trend. According to the latest report that I have seen from Burgess, uh, the latest Q2 marks the sixth consecutive uh, valuation markdown regarding venture capital assets. That's since the beginning of 2022. So suffice to say, uh, the sentiment is pretty low. That, as uh, you can argue from as a, from an investor perspective, is that a good opportunity to buy when everything is coming, so to speak, somewhat of uh, closer to the fair, fair value. I personally think that's an opportunity, uh, that may be an opportunity. Again, venture investment is a very long-term investment. I do not attempt to time the market, neither should our, uh, in my opinion, neither should our investors. So if they do have the risk appetite and they do have the space in their portfolio, then they should have a consistent and continuous uh, commitment to the space. Mm-hmm. All of us, I believe nobody is going to argue that um, venture is the place where you actually see the innovation um, that's really making the world a better place, that's a very disruptive place, and it does come with its own um, challenges and thinking Back 20 years ago, after the dot-com bubble, a lot of the funds raised in those time period were, were having a hard time even to this day. A lot of the funds was, were not um, getting 100% of their investors' capital back yet. So definitely approach this in a very cautious um, approach. Um, but it's not some place that you can, it's not a space that you can ignore. When it comes to implementation, it's really about whether you have access to the top managers. Venture capital seems to have this um, performance persistence um, as analysis shows. And also back to my earlier point, does this client portfolio have the capability to handle this kind of risk for them to maybe sometime in the future benefit from this kind of venture returns. So manager selection matters. Exactly. Uh, and, being, and being consistent in your allocation matters. You're not trying to market time, those types of strategies. I, I'd like to shift our attention to another area that seems to be uh, quite topical these days, private credit. Uh, we hear a lot about uh, money being allocated to the space. It's something you're all very active in it as well, based off of how you shared your clients' uh, breakdown of where they're allocating within private funds. And given today's interest rate environment, given today's, uh, uh, with the banks and the news that we have had this year, in terms of traditional lenders stepping out and alternative lenders stepping in more meaningfully, Mm -hmm. how are you at ANCO approaching private credit from a manager selection standpoint? Yeah, I can only speak for myself. So uh, a little bit about ANCO, we do not have a house view. Again, we want to cater to each uh, specific client's need. Mm -hmm. So from my perspective, uh, I do cover private credit along with a colleague of mine. As you said, interest rate is higher. That naturally push up the expected return of the private mar- uh, private credit uh, investments. So market is definitely clamoring for a lot of investment man- uh, for a lot of investments in the private credit, especially direct lending space. And with the increased expectation of returns, investors are asking about them. In times like this, the caution alarm goes off in the back of my head. 
Whenever there's so many managers rushing into a space, you got to be really, really careful with your man- with your manager selection. So, um, again, g- giving an example here um, for the managers that that are being approved by uh, Anco so far, we、we'll、look for a very long track record. Look for managers who have gone through the the prior the prior global financial crisis, the credit crisis. And if if the manager can demonstrate that how they handled that, what lessons they have learned, that gives us confidence in their capability to navigate whenever or whatever the next cycle brings. So I would say, if not 100% of our approved private credit managers, the great majority of them they do have track re- dedicated tra- fund track record going back to the early days of private credit investing. That's before 2010. Showing a demonstrated and proven ability to actually protect on,、mm-hmm. on the downside、exactly. and through those more challenging markets.、Uh, just in thinking about the next six to 12 months, we don't know what it's going to bring.、Uh, but are there areas in which the team is very active today in looking for investment ideas? So I would say this may sound a little boring. So at least in private market, we have a very continuous and consistent process. For our smaller、uh, clients, we like to、um, recommend fund of funds,、uh, co-investment funds, secondary funds, for them to build sufficient diversification in their portfolio.、Uh, so we will continuously to maintain a list of those.、Um, Fund managers, and for our larger、uh, larger clients who have a more sophisticated private market portfolio, who can、uh, who can afford to commit to direct、um, private market funds, as mentioned earlier, that's our criteria for we we would like to look for differentiated buyout and venture capital managers. Typically, they're specialists. Well, you shared with me、uh, prior to the show that you've been a loyal reader of Howard Marks' Oak Tree Memos for many years. It inspired me to look back.、Uh, I'm a study, student of history, so I can't help myself. So I look back to this time in 2001, about two,、uh, 2001, yeah, 22 years ago or so, and he titled the memo "You Can't Predict, You Can Prepare." So it sounds like you're doing a lot of uh, very uh, uh, good work with your clients. So how are you preparing them for the opportunities that you just discussed with Dan, particularly as it relates to private credit and private markets? What does that preparation、uh, process look like? <laughs> It's amazing how uh, uh, the longevity of his memos are. Twenty years, twenty plus years it ago. It was, and you were just talking about the vol the、uh, the volume of investors chasing a certain asset class. That was one of his core principles, as when it's coming to the end of a cycle. Yes, I mean, just a kind of side side comment. I feel I, I follow his memo because I like his way of thinking. That's a, that's really a philosophy.、Um, some might say that he、uh, <laughs> he he repeats himself a lot and. Reflecting his philosophy in the modern,、uh, in as time changes, he has been in this space for so long, and he, he has seen a lot of ups and downs. His analogy of pendulum swings. Regarding us, we would like to、um, advise our clients that for private market, especially as such a long term investment, the clients are committing their capital for ten plus years. It's impossible to time the market. We really rely on the fund manager who have demonstrated their ability to navigate the ups and downs. And from an investment investor perspective, the best way to prepare would be diversification. In geographic region, in sectors, in your vintage years, so pace your commitment. Do not get ahead of yourself.、Um, do not suffer the proverbial denominator effect if you can help.、Um, talk with your advisor.、Um, have a plan. Revisit your plan on an annual basis. I think that's the best way.、Um, The clients can,、uh, the, the investors can prepare for the un, for unforeseeable future. We are at the top of the hour, and we're always curious the people who have influenced you in your career. It sounds like Howard Marks from a philosophical perspective, but how about from a practical perspective? Who have been the people who have who have helped you along with your career? I would like to thank a lot of 
my previous colleagues who have been tremendously helpful with my career pivot. As we mentioned at the beginning, I didn't really come from investment banking background. I didn't study finance to start with. And I had a lot of great mentors that gave me the opportunity um, and helped me and showed me the way on how to become an investment professional. Some of the things, I guess, some of the things I like to, to mention include never lose sight of the big, big picture. Never lose sight of the big picture. This is from both being an investment professional and being a person in general. Being an investment professional, do not just be an analyst. Think, think like an allocator. Think about how you're going to implement that into, the, into your, your practical portfolio. Thinking from a personal perspective, where do you want to go in your life? Where are you? How do you prepare for the future? And um, I guess another thing I do want to mention for, for my fellow, fellow Asian professionals, I was involved in a lot of nonprofits. It feels like we do kind of undersell ourselves a lot of the time. Um, some, um, one of my mentors who mentioned this repeatedly to me, do not undersell yourself. <laughs> so definitely know what you know, but don't be afraid of communicate that. That's wonderful advice. Our guest last week, Dana Johns, who heads up private markets for the state of New Jersey, uh, her advice very similarly was take a seat at the table. So I think that's great advice that you shared. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for being in Philadelphia since then. It's a pleasure seeing you. Dan, as always, thank you for being here and your wonderful questions. Thank you, Robert. Thanks, Sinsen. That was fantastic. Thank you, Dan. Really great. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. If you want to learn more about Sinsen and Anco Consulting, please visit their website at www.ancoconsulting.com. You can find this episode and past episodes on Spotify, Apple, Google, or your favorite podcast platform. We are also available on YouTube if you like to watch when you listen. And if you would like to catch up on past episodes, check out our website at decoded.com. Finally, if you if you like what you're seeing and hearing, please be sure to like, follow, and share these episodes. We welcome your feedback as well. Sinsen, thank you again for being here. Dan, thank you very much. And to our listeners, thank you for investing your time with Dakota. Don't say good.